Hello and welcome everyone. Chief Lambert here with you today with the Training Rock series. Today we'll be going over emerging illicit drug trends and appropriate first responder management. We have a guest lecturer, Dr. Holstedge. I'll bring Dr. Brady online who will handle that introduction. Dr. Brady, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Scott, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for making time in your busy schedule to learn a little bit about some nasty drugs that are out there in our community. I am delighted and honored to have a guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Chris Holsteg, who is a colleague of mine in emergency medicine and works in the emergency department. He is a professor of emergency medicine and pediatrics, but today he's going to be wearing a slightly different hat. He is the chief of the division of medical toxicology and the director of the Blue Ridge Poison Center. He, uh, don't tell him I said this, but he actually knows a lot about this stuff and continues to teach me every day. I think he's got a lot of uh, important information to let us know about, and um, as you listen to him, I also want you to realize that he is a friend and supporter of EMS. With that being said, Chris? No, thanks, Bill. It's great to be here uh, to talk with you all today. Um, go ahead and advance the slide. First, let me assure you that I, in my disclosure, I have no vested interest in any of these drugs of abuse. Uh, I have four kids who are going to be in higher education. Uh, and like Breaking Bad, I can certainly make a lot of money uh, paying for their tuition by doing this. And we'll talk about that in the market right now and how it's changed. Next slide. Um, we'll talk a little bit about databases. You're going to be hearing a lot out there in the media about what is out and prevalent right now in the United States. And you have to understand those databases. I would argue for us, those of you who are first responders, for myself in emergency medicine, in essence it doesn't matter because we're really dealing with uh, the clinical signs and symptoms when they're presenting. We're not going to know exactly what they took. And even with our analytics, we often do not know. And I take care of these patients in the ICU, and we usually are, we can guess kind of the class of drugs, but it's never quite clear what exactly they got into. I'm going to go through a couple case examples. One is a rebranding of an old substance. One is the development of new substance of abuse, the history with bath salts. And then realizing that plants are also coming on the market too, and it's been an intrig kind of an intriguing development talk a little bit about where we can purchase those drugs and how that's changed over time. Briefly, I want to talk on excited delirium because for first responders and us in emergency medicine, uh, that topic comes up and it's really a garbage term out there. Uh, but it, it does get quite a bit in regards to the media attention, uh, litigation, and as well as some of the journals uh, talking about it. And then briefly on treatment. So next slide. So databases, we're going to start with that first. Next slide. Uh, one is the National Poison Data System, and that is, you know, I represent the Poison Centers. The Blue Ridge Poison Center has been around for about 40 years. Uh, we're there to help you so that if you come on site uh, with an individual who uh, not quite sure what's going on or management, you can get us anytime, 24-7. Uh, my nurses have a lot of experience. I have some nurses who have been here one, uh, 37 years, uh, and they'll get us online too. They always have a physician backup. Um, but the data you may not know, when you're, those calls come in from healthcare providers, first responders, uh, the general public, uh, my nurses make charts. Those charts are auto-uploaded, uh, go to a national database, and that occurs every eight minutes from our center. And that has real-time surveillance that works with the CDC, and we're seen as an important part of uh, health uh, department surveillance nationwide. Next slide. And there's poison centers that go throughout the country and in every state. We have three that are uh, covering Virginia right now. The Virginia Poison Center, the Blue Ridge Poison Center, and the National Capital Poison Center. Next slide. The, I stated that the poison center database for drugs of abuse really doesn't give us information on prevalence, but it does give us information on real-time surveillance. And this really was highlighted back in 2012, 2013, when we saw the bath salts emerge on the market. And as you can imagine, when calls started to come in, when people were stating they were using bath salts, there was a lot of confusion on that. That what exactly were bath salts? They're going to what? Bed Bath and Beyond and snorting real bath salts. But this was picked up uh, by the poison centers initially, and it's an important part of surveillance that we hear about these cases, because then we can start the ball uh, rolling to try and detect what are these exactly, and then to get legislation in to ban these quickly, which is what occurred when the bath salts came up. And I'll talk more about it as we move on. Next slide. There's also the Drug Abuse Warning Network. Uh, next slide. 
this network, uh, there's, there's emergency departments throughout the United States who participate in this. And what they're doing is they're going through medical records and looking to see who has a history of substance abuse, either that they came to the emergency department for that reason or they have a history. And that's where you heard back in the late 2000s, uh, 2007, 2008, that the prescription drug abuse problem actually overtook the illicit substance abuse problem in the United States. And that, again, is on a database based on what is coming into emergency departments uh, and what we're seeing. And so you will see that data, too. Again, each one has a bit of a slant. Next one. We also know there's data out there on where they are getting these prescription drugs. So the National Survey on Drug Abuse and Health uh, was what really showed us that when you're looking at prescription drug abuse, the source where people are getting it is usually from a friend or relative, and that source is usually getting it from one doctor. So that's where you see the government is really trying to crack down on this and looking for aberrations in our prescribing habits. So when Bill Brady's out there prescribing a lot of opioids, he might get questioned on that. And, that's, and we're talking about extremes here in regards to prescriptions. Next. And we know uh, that the deaths associated with heroin are increasing. And so another important data point that we look at is the Virginia Department of Health Office of Chief Medical Op, uh, Examiner. And that is just giving us what is causing deaths, not necessarily the prevalence of abuse and what you're dealing with. Uh, for example, there's some drugs that are never by themselves going to cause deaths. Uh, marijuana, for example, uh, synthetic cannabinoids are rarely going to cause deaths, may, uh, depending on uh, the dose. But certainly we're worried about the opioids uh, with respiratory depression and uh, uh, noxic brain injury. Um, if you look at this slide, we know that the prescription opioid abuse problem is still the biggest cause of deaths in Virginia. However, they've seen a significant increase in heroin deaths, and this has been all over the media. And so. And I can tell you in my practice clinically, we're seeing more heroin related. At least my patients are admitting to heroin. It's not always heroin, though, that's in those substances that they're snorting or injecting. Next. And then the last one I'll mention is uh, monitoring the future. And I like this one. This is the University of Michigan. Uh, they've done a very nice job. Next slide. Uh, they began a survey of senior classes in high school in 1975. They then started to do 8th and 10th graders in 1991, and then all now they do approximately 50,000 students in about 420 public and private secondary schools in the United States. And what this is doing is giving us a snapshot of what the new generation of substance abuse may be. Next slide. So, for example, in 2010, this is what we saw on those surveys. The number one, not a big surprise, was marijuana. The number two was Vicodin. And so they're pretty savvy. They're using prescription drugs, knowing exactly what they're getting. They also have Adderall is on there. Uh, Ritalin is on there. The ADHD drugs are being diverted. Um, if you look on here, and I'll talk about some of these more, um, ecstasy is on there, as well as salvia denorum is on there. However, in just a couple years, next slide, this changed. This is in 2013, and synthetic marijuana then became number two. A new market, and we know that the market is changing. In fact, uh, for those of you who are old enough to go back uh, when I was in high school in the early 1980s, you know this, the people who were kind of the potheads at that time, those who were doing substance abuse, were going to the corner drug dealer, and so you were really limited on what you could get based on what was in your locality. That has completely changed now with the internet and with uh, things such as Silk Road uh, and Bitcoins. People are able to get a number of substances and new synthetics from all over the world and people are being pretty bright across uh, 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 the world right now on how they're both manufacturing and in how they're distributing uh, these substances. And I'll get back to that again. Next slide. So the road ahead is going to be very different uh, than what we saw in uh, the decades previously. Uh, next slide. And this has been highlighted by the United Nations. In fact, uh, this was a report that came out in 2013. Uh, and basically, this was the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. And it stated that the speed and creativity in the emergence of these new designer drugs has left the international drug control system floundering for the first time since its establishment in 1961. And that continues to be the word on the street. 
Next. And we know now there's rebranding of drugs. So starting with the rebranding of old drugs, this is a patient that had come into the University of Virginia Emergency Department, it was a single vehicle collision, uh, was a trauma alert. And you see there, that box there, which is somewhat creative, was a, uh, a white strips box for cleaning your teeth. And they use that to put their drugs in. That way they can snort the uh, crystals that you see in the baggie, which was methamphetamines, uh, on the glass. And then the tablets that you see with the Mercedes signal, uh, symbol uh, are actually ecstasy. Next. And we know that ecstasy is out there and it's been rebranded. Uh, you, for those of you who may have heard, uh, you know, a number of youth deaths that occurred. Uh, sadly, we had a youth death here at the University of Virginia associated with Molly. Molly is a rebranding of what was known as ecstasy, and that is MDMA, uh, an amphetamine, an hallucinogenic amphetamine drug. Um, it's been highlighted on the internet for our youth that Molly is pure that this is pure MDMA. It's not like in the 90s when ecstasy was out and it was impure, but this is pure. And uh, they will know exactly what they're getting. Next slide. However, we know that's not true. There's a site that's ecstasydata.org, and we know from other sites too uh, that what they are actually taking is not necessarily MDMA. Remember, they never know the dose that they're getting. Uh, it can vary significantly from tablet to tablet that they're taking. Um, but they found on this, the last I looked on it, only 23% of substances tested actually had MDMA. And we know that there are other substances being put into these tablets uh, that are causing toxicity. In fact, some of the deaths that were reported out uh, uh, in the public uh, sector were not actually MDMA-related deaths. They were deaths from what was in bath salts. Next slide. And that brings us to bath salts. So we have a rebranding of old drugs with new names, uh, but now we have new drugs that have come out. And for those of you who remember, um, uh, uh, the bath salts were a bit confusing. These were not truly bath salts. It was a way to market um, these agents uh, and get them legally into the United States and to people's homes. Uh, there's certainly trademark infringement that occurred on these substances. Uh, this just gives you an example of some of the uh, substances that were out there. You could readily obtain these. In fact, at the time, uh, you could easily go to the corner uh, here at the University of Virginia, which is kind of the main uh, area. If you're from the area uh, and know this area well, where the students are hanging, and uh, you could buy these at most of the stores, uh, variations of bath salts. And my administrative assistant and my fellow actually went out and were able to buy many of these when these were legal or considered legal at that time. As you can recall, it took a while to find out what was exactly in these bath salts. And the bath salts did not contain true bath salts. And believe it or not, at the Poison Center, we did get calls of kids going to Bed Bath & Beyond and other stores and buying bath salts and snorting them and having a lot of nose irritation and not getting high off of those. Uh, these are actually synthetic cathinones. And cathinones... Uh, Originally derived, if you look at cathinone itself, from COT, K-H-A-T, which is abused in the Middle East. Um, and they did small chemical modifications of that structure and then sold these on the market, uh, realizing that my drug screens in the hospitals are not going to pick these up. And really the testing initially by DEA officials and others aren't going to pick these up uh, either, and they're not considered illegal uh, at that time. Um, as you know, uh, it took a little while for us to determine exactly what was in bath salts nationally. Uh, legislation was enacted in Virginia first to ban them, and then there was federal uh, uh, legislation that then banned them uh, in the entire United States. And based on the Federal Analog Act, things that are similar are also banned. But it's still a struggle. Uh, we have patients who come in. Again, I can't detect these on those patients. Uh, again, on the street and for law enforcement, it's also hard to to do testing on uh, substances right away and know exactly what they, they have access to. That's pretty significant uh, testing facilities that really do this for us. Next slide. Also at that time, the bath salt were the synthetic cannabinoids. Now the synthetic cannabinoids were smoked, unlike the bath salts, which tended to be ingested, uh, insufflated, injected. Uh, these were smoked and were on organic material, like you saw with spice and K2, and they dusted them with real synthetic cannabinoids that were originally, uh, some of them, uh, looked at to be potentially pharmaceutical agents. 
Um, uh, people overseas uh, primarily develop these uh, agents. Again, market them on the internet. Uh, people bought these. Uh, and uh, some of the studies out there, including a study that was done here by our psychiatric department, show that people did these as an alternative to marijuana, uh, knowing that it would not make drug screens positive. Um, it certainly was more expensive than marijuana. Uh, if you look at the street uh, costs, but uh, with a more potent hit. And some of these are exceedingly potent if you look at it on a weight basis for the cannabinoid receptor, some almost a thousand times more potent than THC. And if you remember with these, uh, some of these patients who did these substances had psychoses and got very agitated, had psychotic breaks, some recovered and some actually persisted. And we had a few here at the University of Virginia uh, that had a, a psychotic break and just never fully recovered. The bath salts uh, were uh, really stimulants, kind of like you would see with other things that are sympathomimetics uh, like amphetamines and PCP uh, to some extent. Uh, very agitated patients, uh, combative. Uh, for a while at the University of Virginia, we had patients, I would say a six-month time period where we had almost one a week that would come in uh, who needed a lot of sedatives to bring them down. Uh, again, psychotic, agitated. Uh, very difficult to manage from a medical standpoint and with a lot of organ dysfunction. And we reported some of these in the medical literature. Next slide. Then there's plants. Uh, again, creativity of people in other countries. Uh, if I have hallucinogenic plants that grow in my uh, country and they're not illegal in the United States, I can market them to the United States on internet chat rooms for our drug forums and such. And this is a picture that is taken off the web. Uh, this was uh, Miley Cyrus uh, when she was uh, uh, doing a bong and uh, she said she wasn't doing marijuana, she was actually doing salvina, salvia denorum. Next slide. And the newspapers when this was reported uh, showed that salvia kind of exploded at that time, uh, the sales. Uh, when people found out that, hey, this is legal, I can get high off of this, it's a unique uh, uh, agent for getting uh, high. It's a kappa uh, opioid agonist, um, but again will not make drug screens positive and that's why people were going to those and as you saw with the monitoring the future data, a, a pretty significant percentage of the youth out there were doing salvia denorum. There's certainly many other hallucinogenic plants out there that people can buy from overseas and we'll talk about a few others at the end of the talk, just some pictures. Um, but again, makes it challenging uh, to know exactly what our patients are taking when they come in uh, with kind of agitation or confusion. Next. So where can, you bu where can you look to buy these? Well, one site that is intriguing out there that I think is uh, probably one of the better sites to look into these if you want to do education, uh, learn more uh, on these substances is Earwood's Psychoactive Vaults. Uh, this site, with the website there, you can actually go on and click on it. And for example, and you see on the front page here, DXM, which is dextromethorphan. I can click on that. Uh, that will take me down into a number of choices. For example, I can look to see what's the legal status of dextromethorphan in Virginia. Um, I can look and see what are the clinical effects, and if I want to get high on it, how many milligrams can I, you know, should I take? Uh, there's some internet chat. Uh, forums that you can go on to. It has 3D rotating structures and actually has a very good bibliography. Um, but if you click the more on this for the psychoactive vaults, it will go through a tremendous listing of various substances you can buy, things you've never heard of that I've never heard of, um, or things that are out there that are advocated as psychoactive. Um, and there's quite a listing. This is just one site. Uh, but I think, you know, again, usually fairly accurate in regards to uh, these agents and what's out there. Next. That gets into excited delirium and in treatments. So lots of things that are out there. We're not always going to know what they are. Um, I'm going to have patients that can present in a number of different ways. I can have someone who takes a sedative and comes in who's very sedate, uh, comatose, not breathing. Uh, you're always going to be doing your ABCs. Um, I had one uh, yesterday in the emergency department. Um, then there's always the option if I have a sedate patient where I'm worried about airway of using uh, naloxone uh, to wake them up. And certainly in my practice, naloxone is used in small dosing to bring it up. I titrate it up. I'll put 0.4 milligrams in 10 cc's and slowly infuse it until they're breathing. And I don't necessarily need the patient wide awake. 
uh, but it can be diagnostic and it can certainly protect them from having to be intubated. Um, but then you have the other extreme, those who are exceedingly agitated and what's known as you know, in the literature they'll talk about excited delirium. Next slide. And it's a term that is referred to as kind of a subcategory of delirium. Uh, it's more initially really, really described in the forensic literature. You also will see it called other things such as agitated delirium or sudden death in custody syndrome, a number of different names. Um, it really it was a bit confusing as what was this exactly and it really met with people who were displaying altered mental status with severe agitated combative assault of behavior um, and so it was really describing a clinical syndrome in essence and it's a garbage term and by garbage term I mean it's not specific uh, it really is all-encompassing for someone who is agitated uh, very hard to control um, and there's many different things that can do this including things that are not drugs you know for example someone who's hypoglycemic maybe have manifest what looks like excited delirium or that they're drug intoxicated and they're just have a low glucose when that's corrected the problem comes as a first responder what do I do with these patients um, uh, I don't want them to hurt themselves I certainly don't want my personnel to be hurt um, certainly in the emergency department uh, I, I do not want my nurses uh, techs uh, fellow physicians hurt and so they're going to have to be administered some medication to calm them down so I can do more analysis and that's where some of the struggles have come with these cases because you have to hold them down to be able to give them those drugs they're not going to willingly let you give those drugs um, then the question is you know how do you hold them down and what happens while you're holding them down and that's when sometimes you'll hear about these patients cardiac arresting and I would argue that many of these patients at that point in time including one that we had recently uh, are markedly acidotic. They are so agitated, so wound up, they have a marked acidosis and they may be close to cardiac arresting even before you lay hands on them. Um, uh, the, we had a patient actually that was here in Charlottesville uh, who initially was acting uh, erratic, uh, had excited delirium uh, in essence by, you know, if you're loosely defining it, um, the police were called uh, and uh, he fortunately had a seizure and dropped so no one had to try to restrain him or hit him with a taser. Uh, uh, he was brought into us and he had a pH of 6.5. It's one of the lowest pHs that I've resuscitated um, and he actually became positive for PCP and that's part of the reason why he was so agitated. Um, next slide. And so treatment, you know, we talk about, you know, what are what are the treatment options that you have, and it may take large doses in some of these patients to get them calmed down. Not a couple milligrams of uh, lorazepam or midazolam, uh, but very large doses. Next slide. And there's different options out there for first responders and for me in emergency medicine. And there's debate that goes back and forth as to what are the best agents to use. Part of the problem with this debate is we do not know what is causing their excited delirium or this marked agitation, if we knew exactly what was causing it, we would know exactly what agent to use. For example, the bath salts, marked agitation. I had a number of patients that really took a lot of restraint, uh, a lot of police officers to bring them down um, on the time when that was really prevalent. Um, we know that uh, the bath salts, these synthetic cathinones, there's a lot of dopamine release. Haloperidol actually would have a role. Uh, to block those dopamine receptors so they're not so psychotic. Certainly midazolam and other benzodiazepines uh, have a tremendous role uh, in calming them. They're, they will calm the neural system uh, based on what's called the GABA receptor and in toxicology we like to talk about the GABA receptor because uh, we want to calm our patients down, decrease neuronal activity uh, so that hopefully they will not seize and hopefully their agitation will, will diminish. Then there's ketamine that we're finding more in uh, the first responder realm. And uh, ketamine is an interesting substance because it is an NMDA receptor blocker um, and actually decreases uh, agitation too significantly. And we're, look, we're starting to learn its role uh, in uh, toxicology, in first responder, in emergency medicine. But all three of these agents have a role. All of them are good options from my standpoint. And sometimes it's a combination of these agents. 
you know, the advantages to haldol and uh, haloperidol and, and ketamine are that they won't depress the respirations as much as midazolam will. All three of them hit different receptors for calming effects, uh, and I think all three of them play a role. Uh, haloperidol, some have uh, opined and concerned that you may have some problems with thermal regulation, you may have some QT prolongation. I think those concerns are minimal. And again, I think there's tremendous advantage from a dopamine blocker. So again, you'll see a lot of discussion on these agents, but I think all three play a role depending on what you carry and what your medical direction uh, believes the literature shows. Next slide. And next slide. Realize um, in our patient population in tox, uh, Bill Brady will make fun of me because he will often state that we are often advocating supportive uh, and, and quite frankly, he's right. You know, uh, you could do my training very quickly and just say good supportive care will save the majority of toxicology patients, and that is absolutely true. Um, and so good first responders, good uh, emergency physicians are going to treat these patients with good supportive care, and they will do fine. Um, what are the things that tend to kill toxicology patients? Well, one is anoxia. Uh, they're no longer breathing. They get anoxic brain injury. Um, that's not going to happen once you arrive because you're going to ensure that their airway is intact and that they're breathing. Second is that they get an aspiration pneumonitis. Again, we're going to secure their airway, make sure that they have a gag. If not, uh, we'll you know, secure it or if it has to do with uh, an opioid, maybe give them the naloxone. Uh, so once first responders arrive to the scene, I find that to be less of a risk. Um, Seizures, and seizures rarely will cause, cause uh, toxicology patients to die. Uh, there are times that they will go into status and they might be hard to control, but you're going to use the same algorithms that you use in, as first responders and using benzodiazepines first to stop the seizures. The majority of time that will cause seizures to stop. That leaves uh, cardiac dysrhythmias, and that's the biggest risk from my standpoint. Once first responders arrive to the scene, once they come to the emergency department, I want to assure that they don't go into a dysrhythmia. The other things I can handle, and you know, what am I looking for on, on my rhythm strip, what am I looking for on the electrocardiogram, there's two things that worry me that it can be drug induced. One is you can block cardiac sodium channels causing your QRS to prolong and put you at risk for ventricular dysrhythmia. And this effect with many drugs is made worse with acidosis. Uh, the second is drugs will also cause QT prolongation because of potassium efflux blockade in the cardiac cells leading to torsades. And so uh, a patient who goes into dysrhythmia from a toxicology standpoint typically is treated with sodium bicarbonate and is treated with magnesium. And you'll never go wrong from my standpoint and I'll always support you in giving sodium bicarbonate if there's any question at all, including if they have a wide QRS and you have concerns with that. Um, uh, in toxicology, we like benzodiazepines and we like sodium bicarbonate. Uh, this rhythm strip that you see is a bit unique, and this was a patient that actually presented to the emergency department, had a lot of bruising, was agitated initially and then calmed because he got some benzodiazepines. Uh, you can see a wide QRS, which may make you think that this is a drug that's causing uh, sodium channel blocking activity, but has also uh, got peak T waves. This was a patient who was smoking crack and uh, drinking a drink called wild turkey, uh, was agitated on his front porch and brought in by EMS. Next slide. This was the electrocardiogram, again showing peak T waves, a wide QRS, tachycardia. Next slide. This is the rhythm strip after the patient had a CAT scan uh, and came back from CAT scan just before cardiac arrest. You can see that the QRS is prolonged even more. T waves are markedly elevated, and this was a patient who had profound uh, agitation before they came in, got sedated appropriately by EMS. In the emergency department, uh, treatment was done appropriately, however, it was failed to recognize that one of the complications that you can also see is uh, uh, because of the agitation, the patient had rhabdomyolysis with marked hyperkalemia. And so this patient's potassium was 9 just prior to cardiac arrest, and this is the rhythm strip that you saw just before that cardiac arrest. And so, again, the treatment for that, wide QRS, is going to be a sodium bicarbonate. There's other treatments that we'll deal with in the hospital, from calcium to insulin and glucose, albuterol. Uh, but again, uh, just thinking about some of the complications that we can see in our patient population and why they might cardiac arrest. Next slide. And next slide. 
few remaining things. You all know what track marks look like. Uh, this is a patient that came to the University of Virginia. You rarely see them this well depicted, uh, but this is a track marks going up the patient's arm who came in sedate uh, and then became very agitated, which is why you see the four-point restraints. Next slide. This is a patient who is injecting in her axilla, and so we've seen patients inject in all different places, um, including the neck doing pocketing for uh, direct into the subclavia. Next. Uh, patches, fentanyl patches, we see this not uncommonly. Uh, it's always good to look everywhere on the patient to see if they have something that may still be on. This is a patient actually, one of my partners, Dr. Bear, had seen. Uh, she had rather large uh, pendulous breasts and it was initially missed that she had fentanyl patches under her breasts uh, and came in sedate uh, and uh, with the etiology not clear until those patches were found. Next slide. Skin popping just gives you an idea. It's not commonly seen, especially in rural areas and big cities. Uh, it's seen. This is a patient uh, who was seen um, in a major institution. One of my colleagues uh, took this picture. Uh, you can see the pocket, uh, these marks on her legs. Uh, she's in her 30s. Uh, she has chronic venous stasis uh, from her previous IV injections. Uh, she couldn't hit veins anymore, so she started to sub Q injector drugs that led to these uh, lesions that are you know, is what's known as skin popping, but these ulcers on the legs, on the hands, on the arms, uh, is just indicative that they're injecting sub-Q. Next. Uh, paraphernalia. Seeing someone who's an adult with a binky usually means they're doing amphetamines, typically ecstasy, uh, is associated with uh, bruxism or grinding of the teeth, and that's why they have binkies on their possession. Next slide. And then we see plants in the area. In Virginia, we see people who are abusing local plants too. Jimson weed is not illegal. It's all around the state. It's anticholinergic. These patients also will be very agitated. Um, uh, tend to be hallucinating. Uh, very hard to get them to control. Uh, usually require quite a bit in the way of benzodiazepine to calm them. Uh, next slide. And then certainly there's the challenges of pill IDs. Uh, fortunately now with your smartphones, you can type in these markings that you see here. Uh, here you have Flexeril and MS Cotton. Uh, and a patient who came in who you can see has myotic pupils, has a disconjugate gaze. Um, you can certainly always call the poison center where we will look up and pill ID for you at any time, night or day, uh, to track down what those might be. Realizing it's getting tricky too because the prescription drugs are not only uh, what we have in the United States and are FDA approved, we're seeing more purchasing of drugs like other benzodiazepines from other countries and being shipped into the United States too, or brought in. So uh, sometimes these uh, the markings on pills may not be indicative of a U.S. pill, but maybe from overseas. It may be a little bit harder for you to find. Next slide. Huffing. There's lots of different things that are huffed out there. Uh, everything from uh, here, a case where they're using gold paint and toluene, uh, which is in that, to nitrous oxide, which uh, people use, for example, the uh, uh, chargers for whipped cream uh, in the past, uh, or people will steal these from healthcare facilities. Um, we also see uh, things such as um, uh, nitrites, uh, butyl nitrite, amyl nitrite being abused, which can cause methemoglobinemia, uh, but lots of inhalants of abuse. There's a broad category. Next slide. And certainly there's mushrooms out there. We have the psilocybe mushrooms or the little brown mushrooms that cause hallucinations, and here you see Amanita muscaria, caps, uh, mushrooms. They also see depicted in, for example, the book Alice in Wonderland. Uh, these also cause hallucinations, but also cause seizures. Next slide. And then we also have things such as mescaline or peyote cactus, and then we have nutmeg, which if ground up to whole cloves, uh, mimics mescaline toxicity, and that's because the chemical structures at elomycin, that's in mescaline, or that's in uh, nutmeg and mescalines, uh, uh, are very similar. Next slide. And then you have things such as morning glory seeds that I can grind up, and uh, that acts a lot like LSD or LSD microdots. Uh, uh, paper blotter. Um, there's a number of things out there that just cause hallucinations and again many of these will not make drug screens positive and I will not be able to know exactly what it was the patient took. Uh, they'll just come in agitated and hallucinating. Next slide. And so that gives you a little sampling. 
uh, there's lots of drugs of abuse. We could have a full day symposium on all the drugs of abuse out there, and it would, you still would not have uh, time to be able to explain all of them that are out there. Um, I get, again, I think the management is not necessarily overly complex. Um, uh, if you have a sedate patient, uh, you got to control their airways, and if you have a markedly agitated patient, we're going to have to calm them, and there's a number of different object, uh, a number of different options for calming those patients. Uh, but with that, I'll open it to see if you have any questions. Okay, so as a reminder to everyone, if you'd like to join in the conversation, raise your hand electronically, and I'll unmute you if you have a microphone, or you can send any questions in for the docs uh, via the question feature of the software. So we'll give a customary pause to see if there's any questions from the audience. And seeing none, Dr. Brady, any uh, final words of wisdom from your perspective? No, um, I, I think other than the fact of uh, these drugs are out there, they're constantly changing for a range of reasons, whether it's to get a new high or stay ahead of the law or both, or it's just something fun to do on a Saturday afternoon to make a new drug. So what we learned today probably isn't going to be what is happening tomorrow, so we've got to stay abreast of this stuff because you folks are the first people in the door to encounter what's going on. Now, and please remember, uh, feel free anytime to call the poison centers. They're there to serve you. Also, you're an important part of public surveillance, and we're not going to know about these cases unless you're giving us a call. Um, we really would like to hear about them uh, just to document, hey, this is going on. My nurses will keep it brief, uh, but it's good to know what's going in our respective areas uh, uh, just so that we can put out. If we start seeing certain substances, you're the first in the line. Uh, we can know Sentinel events. Um, uh, please uh, let us uh, know those cases. Um, so, and certainly if there's a question from a medical command standpoint, uh, talking with Dr. Brady, and they can get us online. If there's something that's really unique, I can serve as medical command, my partners can, uh, if there's questions as to what to do. We've had great partnerships with you all in the past, uh, certainly have come out, I've known many of you, I'll let Dr. Brady talk about that aspect, but at any time, again, my nurses can get me on the line to talk with you about certain issues that are going on. So and I just want to reinforce that. Uh, Dr. Holsteg and his other partners are all emergency physicians at UVA. You probably recognize their names and most definitely would recognize their faces. So if you have a definite poisoning issue and you would prefer to use medical command via the poison center, you have the number and if you don't, we'll get it to you. That can serve as medical command. And I will tell you that they are very quick to get on the phone when they are told it is a urgent, emergent issue, particularly from EMS. There's no long waits. They're very fast. So and just one last thing on that, uh, depending on your cell phone and where it originates, uh, if you call the poison center, that may be routed to another poison center uh, with a 1-800-222-1222 number. Um, if you want to get us directly, you can. We have a direct toll-free number, which is 1-800-451-1428. Again, that's 1-800-451-1428. That number goes only to our poison center. You'll be assured to get my nurses and one of us as uh, uh, physicians. It's a little, uh, the cell phones don't track like 911. They will go to the, the area where they originated. The poison centers are good about transferring those back, but it just will cause a delay for you in regards to medical command. That's the one thing I worry about with using that number. So just to make sure everyone's clear on that, if you are from Colorado and you haven't changed your cell phone over to a Virginia number, make sure you call the number that Dr. Holsteg provided. And Scott and uh, uh, others, um, if we can just make sure we distribute that number and everybody have it in their cell phone and maybe even post it in the back of each of our trucks, Certainly, that I'll, would probably be a reasonable thing sure to do. I'll make sure that uh, as we distribute the recording for this, uh, that we also include the, the communication numbers that Dr. Holsteg shared. Great. Thanks, Scott. And so with that, uh, we'll give another customary pause for any interactions or questions you have for either Dr. Holstead or Dr. Brady. And seeing no hands pop up, we'll assume that all of your questions have been answered. And so on behalf of the county, I'd like to extend a, a warm thank you to Dr. Holstead for being our uh, guest speaker today. Uh, we definitely appreciate you coming in and sharing the knowledge that you have from the Poison Center. 
And a quick reminder for next month's session, we are planning for April 21st at high noon. Dr. Rady will be returning to the series following up on our February session. This time we'll be focusing on uh, less common uh, cardiac algorithms as they pertain to um, high-risk cases. Bill, you probably have a better explanation of what we're trying to go over there, so I'll let you handle that. Yeah, so we're going to talk about cardiac rhythms that will kill people that are not your typical VTAC or sinus bradycardia. Fair enough. And I won't say anything more because I want to keep everybody on the edge of their seat. That's right. So uh, information will be followed up soon with that. You'll have uh, webinar links to register. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time out of their day today. And once again, end with a, a final thank you to Dr. Brady and Dr. Holstedge for hosting this event. And with that, uh, we'll catch you guys on the next one. Thanks, everybody.